Welcome to session four. Today we are going to talk about app monetization. An app business has two broad areas. One is app marketing, where you're bringing in new users, getting them engaged, getting them retained, and helping them spread the word about you. And the other is that once you have these users who are, who are using your app, how do you monetize or earn revenue from them? In today's session, we are going to look at app monetization and how you can earn revenue from your app. There are many different paths to revenue, irrespective of whether you have a free app or a paid app, there are different revenue models available to you as a developer to earn money. With paid apps, it's fairly straightforward that somebody is paying you something and therefore you're going to earn revenue from that. But with free apps, things are slightly more complicated. Even though the user is getting your app for free and installing and using it, there are ways in which this might translate into revenue for you. While we're going to look at some of these in great detail, such as the ad revenue and in-app purchase revenue, let's take a moment to talk about mCommerce brand and convenience. An example of mCommerce is an app like Flipkart. The app itself is free to download and install and use, but when you are going to purchase a product from the app, that's when Flipkart will earn revenue. Another way in which a free app might help generate revenue is by helping a company build its brand. For example, a tire manufacturer might build a racing game. And now when consumers play this racing game, they start associating this particular brand of tires with high performance. This association of a positive attribute of the brand will help drive more sales of that brand and lead to revenue. So even though the app is free and there is no in-app purchase or ads within it, just by branding it well and associating it strongly with the brand attribute, brands can get significant benefit from these apps. Another way apps can help generate revenue is by delivering convenience to the end user. For example, if your current bank account offers you an easy way to check your account status, your balance, do fund transfers, etc., through an app, it's unlikely that you will move to some other bank which does not offer the same level of convenience. By making it easy for a customer to interact with the company, you end up building stickiness and loyalty. If the user is going to be with the company for a longer period of time, he will end up generating more revenue for the company. So irrespective of whether your app is being offered for free or it is a paid app, there are certainly many different ways in which it can generate revenue for the company. In today's session, we are going to focus on in-app monetization models. There are two broad situations. One is where the user pays and the other where the user doesn't pay. Paid apps fall under the situation where the user pays for stuff. And when the user doesn't pay anything at all, those models are usually ad supported. In the middle, you have a situation where some users of that app pay for stuff while others don't. And that is called the freemium model. So we're going to look at each of these in detail and look at how within paid apps, you have upfront payment and subscriptions within the ad supported models, you have display and rewarded ad formats and within freemium what durable and consumable purchases are. So let's go ahead and look at each of these in detail. We'll start off by looking at paid apps. 
Now paid apps are a tiny minority today in the overall app ecosystem. In terms of revenue and growth, the in-app advertising model and the freemium model is where the action is. Paid apps today form a very small percentage of the overall ecosystem and they are increasingly becoming models that are not leveraged uh, as much by developers. Within the paid apps model, there are two broad types. One is where you're paying upfront for an app, which means that even before you install the app, you have to pay for it. This model works great for apps that have a certain defined functionality, such as a big name game or some kind of children's app or an app that has niche functionality, for example, like a music equalizer app. On the other hand, you have apps that offer a subscription based pricing, which means that they charge the user on a weekly or monthly or annual basis. These apps offer ongoing value to the user, which means that they have either new content or functionality, or they are offering a service which is ongoing. News apps and magazine apps, music streaming apps, cloud storage apps like Dropbox, all are examples of apps that offer ongoing value and are therefore able to charge a subscription fee every month. When it comes to upfront payment apps, 99 cents or essentially a dollar is the most popular globally. Some of this is legacy from the time when songs were started to be sold at a dollar and when the app store came up, uh, everybody felt that that was a good price point to offer apps for as well. Over a period of time, obviously, things have evolved. Uh, the paid model or the upfront paid model at least has not necessarily become the most popular model for developers to monetize their apps. However, this pricing of a dollar uh, has still continued because it allows people to have this impulse purchase behavior on the app store. Having said that, there are very few apps that actually charge a lot more money. Majority or 90, over 94% of apps on the App Store are priced under $5. This pricing, however, can be set per market or essentially by per country. So you can have an app priced at a certain rate in the US, whereas the price for that in, in a market like India can be much lower. In fact, those lower prices can be as low as rupees 10 in India. Apart from this, the app stores also offer ways to do seasonal promotions or sales to help boost downloads. And these can work very effectively if done well by the developer. So when a festive season comes up, you have the opportunity to reduce your prices and offer a special promotion to the users during that time period, which can help you boost your sales. However, paid apps have significant challenges as well. The first is that the moment the user is looking at an app and he sees that it is solving his problem, however, it is a paid one, the first thought comes to their mind is, do I really need this app or can I get a similar free app on the app store. So users usually go and look for a free alternative as well. And when there isn't one that exists, they really think twice before they go ahead with the paid model. The second is piracy. This is more true on Android, but the simple fact is that if people get hold of your app and the only model in which you're monetizing it is through upfront payments, the chances are people will put up this file on various pirated app stores where other users can come and get it for free. Obviously there are ways to tackle it, but that requires more effort from you as an app developer 
to implement things like digital rights management or DRM. Also, DRM usually requires to, pay, to connect back to the server and do these checks whether the app is from a valid source or not. And this can be a little tricky to do if your app is expected to work offline. The third thing is that users tend to rate paid apps more harshly. They expect a higher quality and a more premium experience without any bugs and crashes on paid apps. For the same app quality, if it is free versus paid, the one, uh, if it was paid, the users would rate it more harshly or rate, give it a lower rating versus the one that was free. And when users come to the app store and they're looking to buy an app, if it is not rated uh, highly, they will tend not to go ahead and make that purchase. So this model really works only if you are able to create apps that have, have a very good quality and a great experience for the user. The fourth is that especially when it is an upfront payment, it becomes a one-time income for supporting a user who might end up being with you for a long time. And if this user or, or managing this user or serving this user requires ongoing costs, such as uh, a backend system or a server, then these costs are going to keep on continuing for a long period of time, whereas the income that you've earned from this user has been only once. So the longer a user uses your service, the lesser you are actually made off that user. Given these challenges, paid app model has not grown as much. Having said that, subscriptions uh, within the paid apps model has seen significant uptake. Uh, and many different types of apps now have the opportunity to be able to charge subscriptions. It was earlier restricted only to some categories, but now it is being opened up to other categories as well. Let's now have a look at the advertising supported model. Now ads and apps are a match made in heaven. Let's look at why I say that. Users love getting stuff for free. And free apps is no exception. Today's ecosystem allows you to offer your apps for free from a distribution standpoint. First is that given that the app is a virtual product, there is no incremental cost when you get one more user to start using it. The second is that you get free distribution via the app store. So given that there is no cost to give away your app for free. Now let's look at the other side. Revenue from advertising depends directly on how many people you can reach and how frequently can you show ads to them. Advertisers also love mediums that allow them to measure everything. And they also prefer mediums where they get a context of where the user was shown the ad. Apps offer a way to reach a massive number of users by giving the app away for free and showing ads to them at a frequency of multiple times a day. They also allow advertisers to measure all interactions right from how many times the ad was shown to how many times it might have got clicked and what was the action that was taken after the click as well. So you have a pretty interesting situation where if you are willing to give away your product for free and have more free users, then you can actually generate more ad revenue. Using ads in apps is now becoming the norm. Almost half of all developers are using some form of ad, ad revenue within their app. And the revenue that you can drive through advertising models is massive. 
Facebook's mobile revenue has actually now overtaken their desktop ads revenue. And mind you, this revenue is in billions of dollars. So if you have an app which has millions of engaged users, advertising based models can generate significant amount of revenue for you. Now the whole concept of showing ads on your app seems pretty simple at the face of it. On one side, there is you, the developer of an app or a game, and you have allocated a space on your app where you can show an ad. This ad space or the supply of inventory is available to an advertiser who has demand for this ad space, which means that he's willing to pay to show an ad in this space. So let's look at this example where there is an app developer, say Angry Birds, and there's an advertiser, which is this deodorant brand called Axe. And how this developer, if they want to show ads of Axe, it, uh, it would seem fairly simple that they would go to this company and uh, say that, okay, give, we can show ads on our app for you. And uh, this developer, this company essentially pays them money to show those ads. But let's look at how it can create some challenges. The first one is that the advertiser, which is the brand manager for the deodorant brand Axe, he has budgets only for his market, which is India. So he will tell this developer, here's the money and please show my ads to users in India. The developer on the other hand is, uh, put his app on the app store and has been downloaded by users in 150 different countries. And India is just one of those countries. So now he has to figure out how does he end up showing these ads only to users in India and not to all users. And then even once he figures that out from a technical perspective, he still has a situation where there are so many other users from so many other different countries who are not being shown ads and therefore are not being monetized. So therefore, in order to increase his revenue to what it should be, he has to go and find other advertisers in other countries. Now, to get an advertiser, you obviously need some kind of ad sales team who will reach out to them and ask them to come and advertise on your app. If it was just India, maybe they could have had a couple of guys and they who would have been able to reach out to advertisers and, and get them to advertise on the app. But now they suddenly have a situation where they actually need ad sales teams in multiple countries to be able to do justice to this business. So now instead of having a great app and developing it and earning revenue from it, they're having to go and build out a sales team who will go and get ad revenue from various brands across the world. The second example over here is that the advertiser has a certain target audience in mind. In the case of Axe, it is male users who are in the age group of 16 to 35 years old. So now the developer, not only does he have to show these ads only to users in India, but even within India, he needs to figure out how do I show it to users who are actually male and in the age group of 16 to 35 years old. He might, first of all, not even know which of his users are male and female and in what age group. So he's not going to be able to show it to the right users. And even if he does solve for that challenge in some way, there still is a situation where within India, he still has 
users who are outside of this age group and our female audience as well they are not seeing any ads because this one advertiser is focused only on a certain target audience which means that even within a certain country he needs to have multiple advertisers who are targeting different sets of users so that all of his users end up seeing some ads and therefore he can maximize his ad revenue so now you have a situation where you have an ad sales team and it is a global team you have use you have ad sales guys for multiple countries and even in each of those countries you need multiple advertisers for whom you need to run campaigns so that you can have a good mix of ads to show across all of your users and the situation of solving for it technically also obviously does still exist so instead of focusing his technical efforts on building a better app he now has to figure out how does he show from a technical perspective different users different ads and once uh, you have multiple different campaigns then which one to show to which user and how many times and now suddenly instead of building his app he is now having to focus on creating technology for ad relevance and showing the right ad to the right user and the third challenge is that even when the user is doing all of this there will be situations where the advertiser has given a ad creative but when the developer looks at it he realizes that it is probably not appropriate for all of his users it's not something that aligns well with the brand that he has created so every advertiser and campaign that is coming in there is some team who is looking at the quality of ads that are coming in and whether they align well with the the policy of the app uh, or the positioning that the app has created or the policy of the company uh, whether it this type of ad is appropriate from a legal perspective in the countries where they are showing these ads and now suddenly you have so many different teams and members in the company who are who have got nothing to do with making the app better but they're purely focused on generating revenue from ads and managing all of the associated technical and legal and operational challenges so now with this context if you think about generating ad revenue on your own as a as a small development company uh who's made a very interesting app and it has millions of users if you were to go and get this ad revenue on your own you have a ton of stuff to do you need to have advertisers across 150 different countries you need to have multiple different advertisers in each country you need to have technology that helps with ad relevance and showing the right ad to the right user you should have the it infrastructure and the technology to be able to sh- do all of this at massive scale and do it really quickly because you're going to be showing millions of users ads um uh, and you're going to be able to do all of this uh very quickly and then in addition to that you will have to then reach out to advertisers and actually ask them to pay you because no none of these guys will pay you in advance so you'll have to figure out invoicing and a team a finance team who is just doing that and following up on payments and as you might imagine doing all of this is literally impossible for an independent app developer unless you are a facebook who has that level of massive scale doing all of this is a big distraction to your core business and it might not even make financial sense and that's where ad networks come to the rescue instead of a developer having to do all of these activities and heavy lifting themselves they can partner with an ad network all that a developer needs to do is sign up with the ad network and integrate their code or sdk to define where in the app do they want to show ads 
and that's it. Ads will start showing up in their app and they can start earning revenue from advertising. There is no upfront cost to this because most of the ad networks offer a revenue share model. Ad networks work with multiple developers on one side and multiple advertisers on the other side. They bring value to both sides of the ecosystem. The developer who signs up with the ad, ad network starts getting ad campaigns from all of these different advertisers. The advertisers that work with an ad network get access to all of the different apps and the audience that is using those apps so that their campaigns can get the scale and targeting that it, they require. So now let's look at a simplified ad flow and how all of this works. When an app user reaches a place in the app where an ad should be shown, the ad code within the app starts talking to the ad network server. So the ad code in the app sends a message to the ad network server saying that I need an ad. And along with this, it mentions some information about who the user is and what the device is and so on. So it see, it'll say this user seems like a boy who is in this age group and on this device uh, using this version of the OS and on this network operator. Can you quickly send me an ad? The ad network server will receive this, this message and figure out if there is a relevant ad to be shown to this user from amongst all of the advertisers and advertising campaigns that it has available. If it does have a relevant ad, then it will send that ad back to the ad code in the app. So the first stage is called an ad request where the app ad code in the app sends a request for getting an ad. And if the ad network server has a relevant ad, it will send it back. And that stage is called an ad served. The difference between the ad served and the ad request is that if a dev if the network does not have a relevant ad to send back, the ads, uh, there will no, not be any ad served for that particular request. Therefore, this brings us to a metric called the fill rate. The fill rate is defined as ad served divided by the ad requests. And Ideally, this should be as close to 100% as possible, which means that for every ad request, there should be a relevant ad that comes back. Think about it. If there is an ad request, and you, which means that there was an opportunity to show an ad to the user, but no ad was received, or there was no relevant ad available, you essentially lose that opportunity to show an ad. And when you lose that opportunity to show an ad, you essentially lose revenue. So when the ad is now served back to the app, the ad code within the app will take this ad and show it on the screen as defined in the code and will confirm back to the ad server that it has shown this ad on, on the app, which means that this stage is called the ad impression stage, which means that this is counted as an ad that is shown to the user now. So now once the ad is shown to the, to the user on the screen, the ad code on the app waits. So they wait until the user clicks on it and maybe in, at, at many times the user will not click on it at all and 
you know, that effort is not borne any fruit. But there are chances that if there is something relevant shown to the user in the ad, the user will tap or click on it. And when this happens, the ad code in the app sends a message to the ad network server confirming that the user has clicked on the ad and that it is now sending the user to the URL or to the link that was provided in the ad. The ad network server receives this request and also now that the user has clicked on that URL, it usually first goes to the ad network server, which confirms that you know it is a valid user and uh, gets all the other details about the device, etc. And then redirects that user to the advertiser website or the advertiser uh, URL. So that's the short and simple flow. You have an ad request whenever there's a chance to show an ad to the user. The ad network server, if they have a relevant ad, they will send an ad back and that will be termed as ad served. If the ad is not served, which means that your fill rate goes below 100% and therefore that becomes a metric that a developer keeps track of. He should keep looking at his fill rate and ensuring that it is as close as possible to 100%. After this, the ad is shown to the user and is counted as an ad impression. And after that, if the user clicks on this ad or taps on this ad, that is counted as well. And then the user is sent to whatever that advertiser URL is. So that's a simple version of the ad flow. Obviously in real life and especially from a technical perspective, there's a whole bunch of other things going on over here. But I hope this gives you a sense of some of the key stages and metrics that you as a, an app developer need to keep track of. When you start thinking about what an ad network is doing, you will realize that there's actually a, a tad much of ba a balancing act going on. Since they work with both advertisers as well as developers, they are trying to balance the needs of both of these uh, users. And the needs for an advertiser and a developer are actually opposite. An advertiser wants to minimize his cost or minimize the money that he spends on his advertising campaigns, whereas a developer wants to maximize his revenue or maximize the amount that of money that he earns by showing ads. And to improve this situation, the ecosystem has evolved another type of platform called a supply side platform. The one single point focus of a supply side platform is to help the developer maximize his revenue from advertising. They act as a single platform that connects to the app on one side and on the other side, they connect with multiple different ad sources. Now ad sources can be many different things. They can be ad networks, such as the ones that we were talking about. So they can connect to multiple different ad networks and therefore multiple different advertisers behind those ad networks. The second type of ad source could be a demand side platform. So demand side platforms usually work with an advertiser to run their campaigns across different ad networks. We've talked about that briefly in our second session. So a demand side platform can also connect with a supply side platform and provide ads to them. A third type of source can be agencies and trading desks who want to run campaigns on various apps. So they can work directly with this supply side platform. And the developer himself can set up campaigns or if he, in case he has gone and 
sold some campaigns on his own, he can use the supply side platform as a way to deliver uh, and show those ads on his app. So all of these different ad sources connect into the supply side platform, which then evaluates which ad to be uh, should be shown uh, for that particular ad request and for that particular user based on whatever the developer has defined and then shows those ad, shows that ad to uh, the user. As you might imagine, an SSP therefore is got all of the same convenience that an ad network had, which means that a developer simply needs to integrate that one code or SDK into his app and he will get ads from across the world from different ad networks and other sources into his app. And at the same time, it gives him much more control over his ad revenue because he's not stuck with one particular ad network. He can work with many different ad networks. He can work with other demand sources uh, and even set up his own campaigns. And with that, pricing has also evolved. Earlier, when you would set up a campaign, the advertiser would define the price in advance at the time of either doing the deal or while setting up the campaign. And all of the ad impressions that were shown or all the ads that were shown essentially cost the same price to the advertiser. With real-time bidding, the advertiser is able to price each ad impression differently. So each ad impression and who the user is behind that can be priced differently. And what this means is that if an app provides better quality data and has more information about who his users are and provides that as part of the ad request, an advertiser can actually bid a higher amount to show his ad over there. And the other thing that this means is that now with every ad request, the advertiser decides the price and when he sends that ad back to be shown on the app, he sends it along with a price that he is willing to pay if that ad is shown. This brings a tremendous amount of transparency into the ecosystem and now the developer can choose to see who is paying the highest and show that advertiser's ad instead of relying on various other uh, ways to maximize revenue. So the advantages of our real-time bidding for an advertiser is that they can bid for each impression differently and they can target at a user level because when an ad request comes in, they can figure out who the user is and based on that, uh, on how important that user is to them or how relevant that this, their ad will be for that user, they can choose to price the bid. And for the developer, they know the best price of before they choose an ad. So when you get multiple ads, as, that, as it happens when you're using SSP and using multiple ad sources, when you get those multiple ads, you can choose from them which one is the highest paying and then show just that instead of uh, trying to figure out which one is just the most relevant. So this brings a tremendous amount of transparency and control for the developer over the ads that are shown in his app. And therefore, uh, SSP can help maximize the ad revenue for an app by always having a relevant and high paying advert to show to users across the globe. Now let's have a look at the type of ads that you can show in your app. As we saw in our previous session, there are three broad ad formats. One is banners, 
these are usually small strips of ads which are shown on the screen or can be shown anywhere on the screen and they can be shown multiple times uh, can be changed multiple times uh, even though the app is uh, you know the user is not moving across various different screens on the app this the click through rate of these ads is typically quite low between half a percent to 1%. But the good thing is that you can choose to stick them on anywhere uh, within your app, which is not always what I would recommend, but it's the easy thing to do. The other type of ad format is interstitial ads. These are full screen ad formats. And given that they are, they can, they take over the entire screen from the app, they should be used only at a natural break within the app. Otherwise, the user will feel like he was using something on the app and suddenly an ad popped up and blocked him from doing whatever he was. These ad formats, given the higher visibility, get a much bigger click-through rate of 1-5%. to The third ad format are native ad formats and given that they appear very similar to the app content, they end up having a much higher CTR as well. So they mimic the look and feel of the app and therefore the user may not even realize that he's seeing an ad until he looks closely. And therefore these seem like, seem less intrusive for the user and the user also sees more value in these because they, do, they don't look like spammy ads. Now let's have a look at an explainer video that shows how a platform, a SSP platform such as Mopub can be used to integrate ads into your app and the benefits that it provides. You make beautiful apps with streams of content that your users love and you wanna make money but sometimes standard ad formats might not make sense. Mopub's platform lets you easily integrate native ads that match the look and feel of your app and preserve your app's great user experience. And unlike other partners, you don't have to limit yourself to just a few advertisers. You can sell your own ads, work with your existing ad partners, and tap into thousands of high quality advertisers who compete for your inventory against your other ad partners on Mopub's exchange. Best of all, Mopub ensures that you maximize your revenue by showing the ad from the highest paying advertiser. To get started, simply download the Mopub SDK. And with Mopub's unique solution, you can change the position of your ads and how often an ad appears directly on Mopub's interface in real time. So you can find the best balance between content and ads for your business, all without updating your app. With Mopub's native ads platform, you'll have more ad partners, more ad revenue, and more happy users. Mopub, turn your content stream into a revenue stream. Let's look at how you can maximize your ad revenue. The first and the most important aspect with ads is to ensure that you have relevant ads to show to all of your users. Since you have users in 150 plus countries, you should have ads for all of these countries. You can do this by connecting to multiple different ad sources. You connect to various DSPs and agencies and also to various local ad networks that are strong in that region. So for example, in markets like China or Russia or Africa, some of the bigger players such as Google and Facebook are not necessarily present or not necessarily the, the strongest. And therefore, in these markets, you should connect with a local ad network and connect it into your SSP so that you get the most relevant ads from these players into your app. Apart from having a good mix of ads for users across the world, the second important thing is to have relevant ads to, for all of those users. 
Now you can show a relevant ad to a user only if you know something about that user and therefore are able to guess what might be relevant for him. When you're using a platform like an SSP or an ad network, a lot of the job of figuring out a relevant ad and ad relevance falls on their shoulders. But what you as an app developer can do is to make sure that if you do know about some of the parameters about the user or some of the information about the user, such as the advertiser IDs for that user, the location of that user, any other demographic information that you may have about the user, you pass those to the ad platform so that they're able to make a better judgment about the ad relevance. You can also partner with a data management platform or a DMP. What a DMP does is that it analyzes behavior of a user across multiple different apps apart from your own and therefore tries to figure out the interests of the user and then uses that as a effective way to serve a relevant ad back to the user. Now having a lot of ads and figuring out ad relevance is not of much value if the user is not going to see the ad and not going to get attracted by it. Therefore it's important to integrate your ads in places that have high visibility which means that the user will not miss those ads, he will get to see them. And when you're using ad formats, if you're using just the plain banner ads, the, it will not end up being very engaging or uh, a good experience. So integrate native ad formats in higher visibility areas to maximize your revenue. Now sometimes in spite of your best efforts, there will be a situation where you, the, there isn't a relevant ad to be shown for the user. At these times, it is best to cross promote your other apps using ads so that your existing users of a particular app get to know about your other apps and might download them. This will help you grow your user base across all of your different apps and you can obviously then monetize those users across all of these different apps. As an app developer, you should always be careful to minimize the number of SDKs that you're integrating into your app. When it comes to advertising, try and integrate only one SDK, which allows you to connect multiple different partners on the server side without having to keep adding new SDKs because then you will have to give an update to your app every time you add an SDK. If you have a significant number of users and you are generating a lot of ad requests, do consider demanding a higher revenue share from your ad partner. They may not always agree, but you should certainly give it a shot. Last, but certainly not the least, make sure that you track your metrics very closely. The only way you will know your performance is by looking at your eCPM. eCPM stands for your effective cost per thousand impressions. This means that for every thousand times that you had an opportunity to show an ad, how much money did you earn? Irrespective of which ad provider you're using, or if you're comparing multiple different ad providers, this metric is of great value. Similar to how we compared different ad campaigns using the eCPI metric, which was your effective cost per install, when you're trying to earn revenue from advertising, you should look at your eCPM. Now let's look at the freemium model of monetizing your app. When we look at different markets and different countries, we see that different revenue models work better in different countries. In countries like India, in-app advertising seems to generate the vast majority of revenue. About 70% of it comes from in-app ads. While 30% of it comes from 
paid apps or in-app transactions or in-app revenue. Whereas if you look at a country like Japan, it's pretty much the other way around. Over 80% of the revenue comes from in-app purchases and paid apps, whereas only 20% comes from in-app advertising. So if you have an app that is global in nature and you're going to have users in many different countries, you also need to account for the fact that you may need to have multiple different models for the same app. Now a core part of the premium model is that some users pay you for stuff while others continue to use the app for free. The users that are paying you for stuff are essentially doing transactions called in-app purchases or IAP for short. In-app purchases are transactions that the user does within the app. And so he's paying for things while he's using your app. This is obviously for stuff or things that he is or, or benefits that he's getting within the app. Now there are two types of in-app purchases, a durable in-app purchase and a consumable in-app purchase. So what's the difference? A durable in-app purchase is when the user pays for something that he will ha always have access to later on. So if a user upgrades from the light version of the app to the pro version, it's very likely that he'll have access to it throughout. Even if he comes back after a long period of time or he uninstalls or reinstalls the app, he will get access to the pro version of the app. A consumable in-app purchase on the other hand is something that gets used or expires after a certain period of time. For example, when you purchase some coins within a game, which you end up using as you play the game, then those coins will get over and you will now have to go back and buy more coins and make another in-app purchase. So the core difference between a durable and a consumable in-app purchase is that one stays with the user for the rest of his life, whereas the other one can get used up or consumed within the app as the user continues to use it or play it. Now in-app purchases can be used in many different ways. People often ask, what is it that I'm asking the user to pay for? Or what should I ask for the user to pay for so that I generate revenue? It depends on your app and the business model that you're trying to drive. There are four broad approaches to in-app purchases. The first is that you charge the user based on usage. So the free version of the app may offer limited usage or limited bandwidth or limited time for it being used or limited storage space. The user can choose to pay and remove these limits or increase these limits. So for example, a newspaper app can choose to have certain number of articles for free that the user can read. But if he wants to read more articles, he will have to pay a subscription or pay for uh, reading them. Another type of model is the free trial model. In the free trial model, the free app contains the full functionality for a limited amount of time. So for example, 15 days or a week or a month, the user can come and use the app for free without having to pay anything. But after the, the trial period ends, he needs to pay to continue using the app. 
A great example of that used to be WhatsApp. WhatsApp earlier had a one year free trial. And then after that, they were supposed to charge the user to continue using the app. But obviously now that has changed since Facebook has bought them. The third model for, fr for freemium apps is based on functionality. The user can choose to play the free version or use the free version of the app and there is no limit, but the user out of his free choice can pay for additional items within the app or for additional content within the app or other such services within the app. And by doing this, he gets access to something that the free version doesn't have. A great example of this is stickers within chat apps. Chat apps or messaging apps have stickers that are available for free, but there are other ones that are available only if you pay for them. So this becomes a great example of stuff that you don't need to buy, but you can choose to buy for uh, additional functionality or ad uh, you know additional benefit within the app. The fourth type of model that people use for freemium apps is based on user experience. You essentially request the user to pay for a better user experience. Here, the free app is supported by ads. So if you want to use the app for free, you can continue to do so and you will be able to do it. However, you will be shown ads within the app. The user over here can choose to do a in-app transaction and pay to remove these ads and therefore have a better user experience. The last one is actually a combination of the above approaches. For example, when users are asked to pay to remove ads, they also might get additional functionality. That is a mix of user experience and functionality. Similarly, there might be a mix of user experience and usage based uh, benefits, or there might be a mix of usage based benefits with functionality based benefits. When we look at the most used approaches for in-app purchases, functionality based approaches are the highest percentage. Pretty much all freemium games use this approach. The second most used approach is based on user experience where the developer asks the user to pay to remove the ads within the app. The third one is actually the combination model and followed by the others. However, it is important to realize that only a small percentage of your users or your monthly active users will actually pay to for any of these kind of in-app purchases. The vast majority, almost 90% of your app users will never pay you anything for uh, using your app. And this brings us to a unique problem. You have millions of users, but only a small percentage of them are actually paying you. All of the others are not willing to pay you actual money. To solve for this, the concept of reward ads is pretty interesting. What you can do within your app is incentivize the user to complete some kind of action within the app and th doing this action can will help you earn money which you can pass on to the develop to the user as a benefit. So the way this works along with in-app purchases is that at the stage where you're asking the user to do an in-app purchase to get either some additional benefit 
in terms of usage or functionality, etc. You can either you can give the user a choice. The user can either a pay money for it and buy buy that uh, in-app purchase, or the user can do some free action that are that is mentioned on these reward ads, and get that same in-app purchase for free. Let's have a look at how this works. You're an app developer, which means you probably ask yourself the following questions a lot. One, how are we going to get new users? And two, how are we going to make money? Fortunately, we've answered those questions for you. We call it the TapJoy Mobile Value Exchange, and here's how it works. Let's say someone is enjoying one of their favorite apps and they want more currency to get more premium content. Well, they have a couple choices. They can pay with real money, which can get quite expensive, or they can get it for free. And if they're like, well, pretty much everyone, free is the much better option. With the TapJoy Marketplace, they have a ton of options to choose from. Say they're in the market for a new car. They simply select the SUV video in the TapJoy Marketplace. As soon as they finish watching that ad, they've earned the premium content they want. It's as simple as that, and it's the ideal way to get more out of any app experience. By engaging with mobile ads, the TapJoy Mobile Value Exchange helps consumers unlock a wide range of premium mobile content. From acquiring new vehicles, to accessing full-length movies, to opening higher levels in your favorite games. Just about any mobile content that can be paid for can be unlocked which helps you, the app developer, keep your users engaged and coming back for more. With TapJoy's network that reaches hundreds of millions of users and drives over one million daily conversions, you'll get noticed by a massive audience that is actively looking for new apps. Suddenly, your undiscovered app starts getting discovered and the installs pour in. Now for the money part. Having more users doesn't necessarily translate into more revenue. Fact is, a very small percentage of mobile users are willing to fork over their own cash for premium content. The overwhelming majority prefers to get them by engaging with advertising messages of their own choice through TapJoy's Marketplace. We'll work with you to integrate high quality advertisers into your app, so each time a user engages with an ad, you get paid. Like it has for a long list of our developer partners, we've helped many of them increase their overall revenue by approximately 60% in Android and 40% in iOS. And when you help increase revenue by that much, developers can't help but say nice things about you. So, if you're looking for new users and a way to monetize your app, you're probably asking yourself this question. How do I get in touch with these guys? Well, we have an answer for that too. Now, when you start looking at countries where you're getting your users from and the countries where you're getting your revenue from, you'll realize that the countries where you're getting the most downloads from is not necessarily the same places from where you're getting the most revenue. Emerging markets like Brazil, India, Mexico, Indonesia will drive a lot of installs and you will have a lot of users in these markets. However, in terms of in-app purchases especially, the vast majority of your revenue will come from developed markets like Japan, USA, Korea, etc. This is a mix of two challenges. One is credit card penetration. Most of the in-app purchases and uh, paid transactions on uh, via the app stores require a credit card. And users in these markets don't necessarily have credit cards. The other aspect is that the users in these markets may not have the ability or the willingness to pay for these in-app purchases because the, the per capita income in these markets is much lower or the attitude of users in these markets towards digital content is very different. When we look at in-app purchase revenue, we will see that Games, even though they have fewer number of overall downloads, they dominate when it comes to the revenue. A key reason for this is that majority of in-app purchases within games 
are actually consumable in app purchases, which means that the user uses them and they get over and then the user has to go back and buy more. This is very different from apps where majority of them have durable in-app purchases, which means that once a user pays you for stuff, he's not going to pay you again. And therefore you have to go and get more users to generate more revenue. This is now changing a bit with subscriptions coming in for all type of apps. So now that we've looked at all of these models, as you might realize, you need to combine these different models to maximize your revenue. If you have a free app, there is no harm in having a paid version of it as well. If you have, when even in within your free app, you can always choose to have ad supported models as well as premium in app purchases in, in the same app. Within premium as well, you can use choose to use uh, reward ads to further maximize your revenue. Therefore, it's important to, to see which of these models best fit your app and try to put in as many of them as possible. With that, we come to the end of this session. If in case you have any questions, feel free to ask them on the forum or on the live session that is coming up. Thank you for your time and I hope you found this course useful. If you have any feedback, please do share it with us and I look forward to staying connected with you.